Hi, my name is uh, Bridget Scanlon. I'm a senior research scientist at the Bureau of Economic Geology. And uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, produced water in Texas. And I want to uh, share my screen uh, with you. So I would like to acknowledge uh, my co-workers, uh, Bob Reedy, Chen Yang, uh, JP Nico, uh, Becky Smith, and uh, Svetlana Ikonikova. Uh, we all work on different aspects of uh, produced water, and we work at the Bureau of Economic Geology, which is part of the Jackson School of Geosciences at the University of Texas. There are a lot of uh, questions about produced water uh, these days, and the legislature generated a report um, on, uh, from the Senate Committee on Water and Rural Affairs. And on the right-hand side, you can see uh, the uh, projected uh, water demands for hydraulic fracturing for the different uh, oil and gas basins in Texas and elsewhere, and then the projected produced water volumes and then uh, the excess produced water after subtracting the water that could be reused for hydraulic fracturing. This is based on um, a report that we published, uh, Will Water Issues Constrain Oil and Gas Production in the US in 2020? And um, what you can see from these data, this is the projected water volumes over the life of the plays, and that's estimated to be about uh, 50 years. The heading on this uh, suggests the United States Basin projected water 2009 through 2017, but really it's the projected water volumes over the life of the play, and that's approximately 50 years. So you can see in the Delaware Basin, which is the western part of the Permian Basin, we project about 23 million acre feet over the next 50 years. So that's about a half a million acre feet uh, per year. Um, and we project 2 million acre feet uh, for the Midland Basin, which is the eastern part of the Permian Basin. Um, there is no excess produced water uh, projected for the Eagle Ford play, and then the other plays, uh, the Bakken in North Dakota, as a small projected small volumes, and the Marcellus in um, Northeast US. Um, so how do these projected water volumes compare with how much water we use in the state? Uh, so the Texas Water Development Board tracks water use in the state, and here we show the historical water use from 2009 to 2018 in million acre feet for the different sectors. And you can see that over the past few years, 2016 through 2018, the average water use was about 14 million acre feet. Uh, so the 23 million acre feet for the Delaware Basin uh, exceeds uh, the um, water use and slightly exceeds the water use, but that's over 50 years. So that's about a half a million acre feet per year relative to a total water use of about 14 million acre feet. There's also a lot of concern in the state about water deficits um, and unmet water needs. And the Water Development Board in their state water plan uh, suggested that almost uh, 3 million acre feet of um, unmet water needs uh, from 2020, increasing slightly in 2070. And most of these are for non-municipal water use, primarily irrigation in the state with small volumes for municipal water use beginning in the 2050, 60, and 70 decades. So we can compare the projected half million acre feet with the unmet water needs also in the state, which is about 3 million acre feet uh, per year. So uh, the other issue is that uh, with the, all of the produced water that's generated in the Permian, Basin and uh, the current management strategy is primarily uh, disposal in the subsurface or reuse for hydraulic fracturing. So much of it is disposed through saltwater disposal wells. And we have uh, the University of Texas Bureau of Economic Geology Center for Integrated Seismic Research and the TexNet uh, Seismic Network have been recording seismicity in the Permian Basin and other regions of the state for the past several years. And here I show a snapshot uh, for the, since 20, December 31, 2021 through the present. 
and I'm only focusing on earthquakes uh, for magnitude four and higher. And you can see uh, some magnitude uh, greater than four or, or higher in the northeast part of the uh, Texas um, high plains, but also uh, in the Midland region uh, on New Year's Eve in 2021, and also in this region in the Delaware Basin. Um, these mustard colored are also uh, mostly fours. Um, so increased uh, seismic activity that uh, can be related to hydraulic fracturing, injection water, and also saltwater disposal. And uh, this research group in, at the Bureau is uh, analyzing these data uh, intensively. So recently, the Texas Railroad Commission set a cap um, on this uh, subsurface uh, injection for disposal at 10,000 barrels per day west of the in the Midland and western part of the Midland region. And this is the first time that they have ever set a cap on subsurface disposal per well. So we conducted a study that was published in 2017, looking at uh, water issues uh, related to the transition from conventional oil production to unconventional oil production from shales. And um, here I show some of the results from this study. So uh, in, we were looking at data from 2005 through 2015. And each of these bubbles, uh, the green bubbles represent the oil production, the orange is the gas, and the gray is the produced water. And uh, then the red is enhanced oil recovery or uh, subsurface water, uh, salt water disposal, uh, which is the management of produced water. So on the left-hand side, you can see the volumes for conventional wells. And you can see conventional wells um, produce a lot of water, 40 um, billion barrels over this 10 year time period. Uh, but most of that water goes back into the reservoir uh, to maintain pressure in the reservoir so that they can keep producing oil and gas. So 36.5 out of the 40 was estimated for enhanced oil recovery. And some of this water goes into salt water disposal wells into other units that are not reservoir units. In contrast, unconventional production in the Permian Basin uh, generated much lower volumes of produced water, about a tenth over this time period because it was just getting going. And, and so the produced water to oil ratio is much lower in unconventional reservoirs. These are shale reservoirs. Uh, and here we can also show the volume of water that was used uh, for hydraulic fracturing. So because you cannot put it back into these low permeability, unconventional reservoirs, these shales, you have to dispose of it in other units. Um, and then it goes into salt water disposal. Um, and then uh, disposing of it in other geologic units, either shallow or deep, can change the pressure in those units and can result in seismicity. Um, so that is the problem. So in the past, although we've produced oil and gas for over 100 years in the Permian Basin, um, uh, most of that water has gone back into the reservoirs uh, to, uh, through enhanced oil recovery to support, uh, keep, maintain the pressures in the reservoir to continue production. But now with unconventional uh, development, we cannot put the produced water into the reservoirs and we have to put it into other units. And it is, is causing, uh, this is part of the reason we're seeing induced seismicity, which has increased in the region since 2010. So I'm going to try to ad address three basic questions in this presentation. Uh, how much water we use for hydraulic fracturing. Uh, and this is important because the produced water could be reused for hydraulic fracturing of future wells. And so I want to emphasize that aspect of uh, unconventional development, then how much water we are producing with unconventional oil and gas development, and then optimal ways to manage uh, the produced water uh, in these unconventional reservoirs. So we use a variety of data types, geology, hydrology, reservoir data, and uh, well completion and production data. 
and we look at historical trends in fra hydraulic fraction water demand and produced water volumes. We also uh, develop projections over the life of the play of hydraulic fraction water demand and produced water volumes. And this is about you know, 20 to 50 year time frame. And we look at the impacts of the water use on water scarcity in the regions, groundwater depletion, and also uh, some other groups look at induced seismicity. And we evaluate different approaches then to try to mitigate adverse environmental impacts uh, by reusing produced water for hydraulic fracturing, which is the lowest hanging fruit because we can use um, produced water with uh, clean brine with very little water treatment. We also considered the potential for beneficial use outside of the energy sector. So here I show work that we published to last year in environmental science and technology, showing uh, the increase in hydraulic fracturing water demand in the Permian Basin. And uh, in 2017, it totaled about 50 billion gallons or um, almost 200 billion liters. Um, so 20 per, uh, it represented about 20% of water use in other sectors in the Permian Basin. Um, and the high water use for hydraulic fracturing represents long lateral lengths drilled for hydraulic fracturing up to two and three mile lateral lengths and the high intensity of water used to fracture the rock, uh, about uh, 2000 gallons per foot of lateral length or 50 barrels per foot in 2017. Um, so the total lateral lengths for unconventional oil and gas uh, development in the US totaled about four times the circumference of the earth uh, to that point. So here we show the Eagle Ford with much lower water demand for hydraulic fraction because uh, it's a different play and each play is slightly different. The Bakken has even lower water demand for hydraulic fracturing. And uh, then the gas plays are similar to the oil plays um, with the Barnett peaking in 2011 and decreasing, Haynesville and uh, Fayetteville. So these show the different plays in the US, but the Permian has the highest water demand for hydraulic fracturing of all the plays in the US in recent years. Um, so, um, so then we developed projections of water demand in the future over the life of the play. And here we show the volumes for the different plays in billion gallons. Um, and you can see the Permian is divided into the Delaware Basin in the Western part of the Permian Basin and the Midland Basin in the East. And we estimate that there will, we focus on only two of potentially 10 units that could be developed. And these are the Wolf Camp A and B and assume that all potential wells would be drilled in those two units. So we feel like we're developing conservative estimates because we're ignoring many of the other units that could be uh, developed more in the future. So we estimate about 200,000 wells would be drilled in the Delaware Basin and about um, 100,000 wells, 110,000 wells in the Midland Basin. And uh, to support this, then we would need about almost uh, 3,000 billion gallons of water in the Delaware Basin and about 2,000 in the Midland Basin. Um, water demand in the other plays are lower, as we saw from the, the time series in the Bakken and the Eagle Ford and uh, the Marcellus. So where is the water coming to support hydraulic fracturing? We look at uh, the Texas uh, Department of Licensing and Regulation and they indicate what the wells, where the wells are drilled and what they're used for. And so here we show in the Permian Basin, the water wells drilled to support hydraulic fraction has uh, been increasing in recent years and has varied over time. But in uh, 2017, it uh, totaled about uh, 1500 wells in that year and more recently up to 2000 wells. And we estimated that about a thousand wells were drilled in the Ogallala Aquifer in 2020. Um, in the other place, then much lower numbers of wells were drilled to support hydraulic fracturing uh, in Texas. And um, the well drilling then and uh, extracting water from aquifers to support hydraulic fracturing 
um, is more important in the Delaware Basin than in the Midland Basin because the groundwater is connected to surface water uh, through springs such as St. Solomon Springs in Valmoray and also discharging to the Pecos River. So excessive water depletion uh, in these regions could impact springs and surface water. And so we have to be cognizant of that also. And so some water could be uh, derived from produced water recycling. And we have report, we, however, we don't have any uh, specific reporting on how much of the hydraulic fracturing water demand is met by produced water reuse and recycling. So then we also uh, looked at historical uh, produced water volumes in the different uh, plays. Um, and this is over the period 2009 through 2017. And so what you can see is that uh, the oil plays in the uh, Western US uh, generate much more produced water uh, than the gas plays in the Eastern US. And uh, Oklahoma, uh, generated a lot of produced water. And some of this was uh, not necessarily from unconventional wells. I mean, some of their wells were generating up to 200 barrels of water per barrel of oil. Uh, in the Permian, then, it uh, produces a lot of water also. It has produced a lot of water. So 180 billion gallons is approximately 0.5 million acre feet uh, when you consider over this um, uh, period, almost 10 years, relative to how much water we use in the state, which is about 14 million acre feet in the past um, a few years. Uh, so uh, we have uh, generated a fair amount of uh, produced water um, in these oil plays. And as I said, most of it is managed through subsurface saltwater disposal. So here are projected water volumes, produced water volumes for the different plays. And as you can see, the Permian Basin um, uh, is projected to generate much more water than any other play in the US, uh, particularly the Delaware Basin, uh, with about 10,000 billion gallons uh, in the Delaware Basin and uh, 2,600 in the Midland portion of the Permian Basin. Uh, so the projected to produce water 40 million, this corresponds to 40 million acre feet and is about a three times the water use in the state, which is about 14 million acre feet. Um, so that's over the next 50 years. Um, and so then uh, we come to the question, how can we manage uh, water issues for unconventional reservoirs? So looking at the historical data and comparing produced water volumes to hydraulic fracturing water volumes, we can see uh, that uh, in many plays, in some plays, for example, the Eagle Ford, the hydraulic fracturing water demand exceeded the produced water volume. So they could reuse the produced water for hydraulic fracturing and use all of it. Um, but that uh, assumes that uh, you, know, you have spatial and temporal connection between produced water volumes and hydraulic fraction water demand. In the Permian Basin, they are fairly similar. They're more similar in the Midland Basin, uh, the hydraulic fraction water demand and the produced water volumes, but uh, it's about two times more produced water in the Delaware Basin than in uh, than the hydraulic fraction water demand. You can see in Oklahoma, the produce much more water than they needed for hydraulic fracturing. So even if they reuse the produced water for hydraulic fracturing, they wouldn't be able to manage it. And so they still had large excess produced water they would need to manage in other ways. So um, in the gas plays, you know, they could easily manage the produced water. A lot of people indicate that in the Marcellus, uh, they reuse most of the produced water, but you can see the volume of produced water is very small relative to the hydraulic fracturing water demand. So they can accommodate uh, that produced water fairly readily. So uh, we uh, published uh, this study comparing uh, the projected produced water volumes in hydraulic fr fraction water demand. And uh, we indicated that uh, we could partially mitigate uh, the uh, water issues uh, by sourcing, uh, by combining 
the, by reusing the produced water to support hydraulic fracturing. Um, uh, but even still, we have an excess of produced water, particularly in the Delaware Basin, which is almost uh, four times the water demand for hydraulic fracturing. So we have to figure out other ways of managing produced water in the Delaware Basin. Um, so we just talked about uh, these data. Um, so uh, the, uh, in the first, uh, second slide, I showed uh, the legislature report, which looked at our numbers. And uh, this is the 23 million acre feet of um, excess uh, water if you uh, maximize reuse of produced water for hydraulic fracturing in the Delaware Basin. And that's over the next 50 years. And that's about a half a million acre foot a year and very little excess produced water in the Midland Basin uh, because the two are more matched. So the Delaware Basin is really uh, the key area then where we have excess produced water. Um, so what can we do with the, this uh, excess produced water? Well, as I mentioned, you know, the, the optimal approach would be to maximize reuse for hydraulic fracturing. And uh, this is the lowest hanging fruit because we need very little treatment of the water to do this. Uh, we can use a clean brine with minimal water treatment. And, um, and so the economics are favorable and we have a lot of midstream water companies like Waterbridge and Solaris and NGL uh, that are developing infrastructure to store and transport uh, the produced water uh, to facilitate reuse for hydraulic fracturing. We could, uh, the other great highest demand for water in uh, these regions is generally irrigated agriculture. Uh, so people suggest that we could uh, uh, use the water for irrigation. Uh, the legis uh, TCQ now has um, uh, is responsible for any discharge of uh, treated produced water into streams, uh, such as the Pecos River. So treat the produced water and discharge it to the Pecos River. Or we could use it for groundwater recharge and recharge the depleted aquifers. However, there are a lot of uncertainties about uh, the reliability of the treatment process, and we need to go carefully and so if we want to use it to, to recharge the aquifers, we think that uh, we should consider the spreading basins and allow the treated produced water to equilibrate with the sediment so there wouldn't be compatibility issues when it reaches uh, the aquifer. Um, so I'm just going to look a little bit at irrigation water use. And so here you can see in the Delaware Basin, irrigation water demand exceeds the produced water uh, volumes, and this is based on data for uh, 2015 and 2017, the most recent data that we have. So if we maximize reuse of produced water for hydraulic fraction, we'd have about uh, 20 billion gallons of produced water, and that could uh, um, accommodate or could account for about 10% of the irrigation water demand in the Delaware Basin. So JP Nicole has done intensive studies on a produced water quality. And you can see in, from his analysis that the produced water is fairly high quality with 25,000 TDS in the central portion of the Delaware basin and increasing outwards to about 125,000 milligrams per liter total dissolved solids towards the margins of the basin. Uh, and so you could imagine that possibly you could treat the, uh, sorry, treat the produced water in the central parts of the, the basin with reverse osmosis, which would be uh, cheaper than thermal distillation. However, I heard recently from some treatment companies that they prefer the higher TDS water because then they can get other products like salts and other things that they could market. Um, so here I just show, uh, you know, different treatment processes that, that would be required for different beneficial use purposes and uh, emphasizing that very minimal treatment would be required to generate a clean brine that could be used for hydraulic fracturing. But as you change the use to industrial uses or ag agricultural uses or groundwater recharge, you know, the treatment requirements increase a lot and uh, therefore the costs also increase. So economics is a big issue in determining the feasibility of uh, reusing produced water in other sectors uh, relative to the reliability of treatment. 
So there are a number of data gaps. We don't have reporting of produced water volumes uh, um, in Texas or other regions. And uh, we don't have uh, uh, specific reporting on the extent of produced water recycling for hydraulic fracturing. Uh, frac focus is moving in this direction and hopefully the companies will start reporting how much of the produced water they are using to support hydraulic fracturing. In Texas, uh, uh, we have limited data on the, the uh, chemistry of uh, produced water. Um, and then uh, Environmental Defense Fund has been doing in a number of studies to evaluate uh, the produced water quality relative to treatment options and standards for a discharge uh, to rivers and streams and um, land application, irrigation and others. Uh, so in, in Pennsylvania, they treat the produced water and discharge it into some of the streams, but the assimilative capacity is much higher because the stream flow greatly exceeds the discharge of produced water by up to 100 times or more, whereas in the Pecos River, the, the discharge is very low, and so the assimilative capacity would be very low. Uh, so risk assessment and toxicity of treated produced water is extremely important in understanding uh, how safe it would be to use uh, treated produced water in other sectors. And we need uh, lab and field testing then to assess the uh, viability of aqua recharge of treated to produced water. Uh, the Texas uh, Produced Water Consortium is being led by Texas Tech University, and I think they will be looking into a lot of these issues in the near future. So to summarize, uh, in Texas, produced water, about 50% of produced water in the state is derived from conventional oil reservoirs and about 50% from unconventional reservoirs. And most of it has been managed in the past for enhanced oil recovery or salt water disposal. Uh, the quality is variable, but we have limited information. And um, uh, produced water um, is, um, is generally not uh, located in the same regions where we ha have identified water deficits in the state water plan. Induced seismicity is a concern and has been linked to hy both hydraulic fracturing and to salt water disposal. And they may, this may restrict uh, oil and gas development in the future. Um, and I think the lowest hanging fruit in terms of management is to maximize reuse of produced water for hydraulic fracturing, because we can use clean brines with minimal treatment and the economics should be favorable. Reusing pre treated produced water outside of oil and gas sector, for example, for discharge of the Pecos, uh, we need regulations uh, to manage this uh, through the uh, NPDES program. And uh, unlike in Pennsylvania and regions in the Northeast, we cannot rely on large uh, surface water discharges to dilute uh, the discharge of treated produced water. Uh, reuse in other sectors uh, will require intensive treatment and risk assessment on treated produced water uh, to determine optimal treatment approaches. I would like to acknowledge uh, our funding agencies for this work, ExxonMobil, uh, Shell, uh, the Mitchell Foundation and the Sloan Foundation, uh, Apache and IHS provide their database and also the Jackson Endowment. And I would be glad to answer any questions. If you have questions, feel free to email me uh, in the future. Thank you very much.